we're starting it off with uh, with uh, Danny Ryan. So um, thanks for having me. This was a little late notice on my end. Uh, I think we decided to do this about like 16 hours ago. Um, so I don't have anything very officially prepared, um, but I figure I'll give you the rundown, maybe a little bit of a what, why, when, who, and how on these two. And then hopefully there'll be some questions. And if there aren't some questions, maybe I'll ask myself some questions. Um, cool. So I guess we'll start with the what. Um, wh what is these two? And, and maybe we'll intermingle the why to, to give it a motivation throughout. Um, but ACE2 is a, a scalable, sharded, proof of stake uh, consensus layer. That re that's really what it is. Um, it's not, uh, well, we won't get into what it is, what it is not, yes, but a scalable proof of stake sharded consensus layer. Um, and I say consensus layer because rather than blockchain or rather than um, virtual machine or state or, or, or thing, the computation thing, uh, it, it really, at its purity, when you, when you look at the spec, when you look at what these two clients are doing, is they're building um, a relatively complex consensus layer that is really good at coming to consensus on things. Um, and I know that sounds silly, right? That's what a consensus layer should do. Um, but in most blockchains that we know today, and the Ethereum blockchain that we know and love today, um, that consensus layer is um, it's very simple. Um, it's proof of work, most of the complexity, it's not simple, it's a, it's a technological breakthrough, absolutely. But uh, most of the complexity is handled extra protocol in the sophisticated hardware. Um, and uh, it's really tuned to be able to come to consensus on like this one pretty specific thing, like a single, a single blockchain. Um, whereas, what we're building in ETH2 is a consensus layer. Um, really purely, what the spec is today is it's a proof of stake, a scalable charted proof of stake version of proof of work in that it, um, instead of just being able to come to consensus on a single chain, uh, it can come to consensus on many um, while not reducing um, the security profile of the assets securing it. Um, and so what this complex thing that we're building is uh, and has done is, is the ability to come to consensus on way more things than just a standard proof of work blockchain. Um, and I, I focus a lot in the discussion on like consensus and that this thing, it really is a consensus, like what we've built is this thing that can come to consensus on stuff uh, because um, because what you actually put in there um, is very modular um, in, in, in what can what these shard chains can actually can actually be placed in there. Um, sorry, it's four in the morning. I'm, I'm trying to gather myself and drink some tea. <laughs> um, okay, so. We have a scalable consensus. Now, what do we put in there? We talk about uh, shard chains. We put in a bunch of shard chains. Um, what does this actually do for us? Um, how is this actually Ethereum if we just built this like big consensus thing? Um, well, the vision now is uh, we have we have a blockchain. We have this thing that we we can come to consensus on. Um, we usually do it with proof of work, um, but we're going to migrate that thing into the scalable consensus layer that we've built in ETH2 um, as one of the shards. Um, so now we have the foundation for the entire system. Now we have the um, <clears throat> unification of this new consensus layer with our existing protocol, our existing community, our existing applications. Uh, but we have it in this new and better context. Um, better why, um, one, we're not burning tons of energy on proof of work. That's uh, some people really love that. Uh, a lot of people are trying to get rid of that. So, yay, we'll get rid of that. Um, the security profile of proof of stake actually um, 
is from our research uh, can be much better than proof of work um, because the protocol, the assets securing the protocol are actually inside of the protocol. Um, and so it can be subject to the rules of the protocol. So you can not only incentivize with rules, but you can incentivize with penalties. Uh, and so you get a, a stronger, um, you get a wider kind of gap on the, the range of what you can do and to incentivize against these assets. Um, and why is it better? Because like I said, this consensus engine can come to consensus on a lot of things. Um, and so instead of just coming to consensus on the ETH1 chain when it's slotted in there as a shard, um, we can come to consensus on many other shards. Um, and the question is, well, why do we, what are we gonna do with all these shards? Um, <clears throat> for one, first and foremost, this consensus engine is like a data availability machine. Uh, ensures that we have tons of data available to the system um, in the form of shard chains. And these, <clears throat> Even with just ETH1 in there, with a ton of these shard chains, um, there's room for massive, massive scalability with some of these new applications and layer two uh, constructs that scale with uh, layer one data, um, rollups specifically, uh, ZK rollup, fruit rollup, uh, you know, OVM rollup, all that good stuff. Um, and so even just ETH1 in this new highly scalable context in terms of data, uh, can bring us like orders and orders of thousand x order magnitude uh, scalability, um, and that's that's probably the first executable version of of ETH2. Um, and again, ETH2 is ETH1. ETH2 is Ethereum um, in that context because we've brought over um, what Ethereum is into this new context and kind of given it uh, superpowers. Um, and then from there. Uh, the next the next phase would then to be add uh, additional um, state and execution onto these shards and communication uh, between them. But even in that kind of what we've been calling a phase 1.5 and that iteration of this, uh, we do kind of achieve this like massive scalability. We achieve this vision of proof of stake um, and a like more longer term sustainable protocol. So that, and again, 4 a.m. trying to put this together. Uh, that is what Ethereum 2 is. Um, and I think I interspersed a little bit of the why. Um, specifically, uh, proof of work consensus and simple versions of proof of state consensus um, really have a bottleneck on how much they can come to consensus on um, that singular chain paradigm. And there's some things you can do to get some scalability out of that single chain, um, some layer one scalability out of that single chain. Um, for example, you can have bigger blocks. Huge debate in the Bitcoin community years ago. Um, you know, what does bigger blocks do? Um, one of the things that it does is actually puts more load on the network, the networking requirements. I um, mean, it put more, puts more load on the um, computation and storage requirements for a, um, like, so the resource requirements for any node that wants to participate in this thing. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, make, make blocks a gigabyte uh, or, yeah, you know, 100 megabytes, um, pass these things around. But all of a sudden, you're going to limit who can participate in this protocol. Um, you kind of lose the ability for average computers and average nodes to fully validate um, the validity of this protocol and the validity of, of things happening as you go into that scaling route. Um, and so if you just take the single chain paradigm and you try to put it on steroids, you make it on really fast blocks and really big blocks, um, you lose, you start ratcheting that up, you can gain some scalability, but you lose the... Um, you lose the kind of the openness of the protocol, the democratic nature of the protocol, and the ability for all sorts of other people to um, validate the protocol, other than maybe just the consensus participants. And the can I ask you a question in between? Yeah, please do. Interrupt me as much as you want. Sharding. We started out at one twenty one thousand twenty four. And yeah, then yeah. that walked down and down and down and came down to like, okay, we're going to do a shard. 
is the first part of my question. So how did that process happen? What was the limitation there so that people understand that? Because there's good technical reasons and good social reasons for how the original sharding proposal stepped down. And when you come off of that, that bit, I'm going to kind of like maybe poke the community in the eye and kick the elephant in the room. And I'd like you to talk about how Ethereum is approaching 2.0 sharding is different from what Polkadot is doing. Because it would be really good to have from, from an insider how it is that you guys are different between the sharding approach that, that Gavin's doing with, uh, with Polkadot. Yeah. Right, right. So um, specifically in the, in the spec and um, fully the intention right now is to build 64 shards. Um, the 64 shards where likely at the beginning, 63 of them are data. 63 of them are purely um, data availability constructs to aid the system in having um, data available to the single shard that has execution, which would be the integration of, of um, ETH1. And so the originally, some of, some of the bounds on the amount of shards that uh, the system can handle is with respect to the amount of <laughs> the amount of nice cat, beautiful cat, the amount of participants, um, the amount of consensus participants that you can have, um, and that is bound by the number of signatures uh, that you can process and send around the network. So specifically, um, <clears throat> when we shard consensus, we take the in consensus participants. We often call them validators and proof of stake. We take however many we have, um, and we're kind of splitting them across. Uh, we're taking the core consensus and then splitting, sampling them, and splitting them across um, the shards and splitting them across the consensus um, in a random fashion, so that they kind of have individual duties to different subsets of the, of the system at any point. Um, to maintain a good security profile based off of the one third assumption of like malevolence in the system. Um, you have to have a high enough validator, a high enough validator pool per uh, shard that you want to randomly sample across, such that no shard is going to be overtaken by. Um, or just take a, um, two thirds of like an, an evil participant uh, based on the random, random sampling, um, and so you have to have a lot of participants to be able to have large enough committee sizes, large enough committees of validators on each uh, validator, on each shard. So um, that gives us kind of a baseline. We have, if we have N shards uh, and we have things, we have S shards and N validators um, and we need to split them across the shards at any given point and we need to have uh, these shards be of a particular size, and that says how many of these like individual validator participants um, in the consensus that the minimum that we need. Um, but then we also uh, each time each time the validator has like a duty with respect to a shard, um, they're going to do some, a certain amount of load because when they do something with respect to a shard, they're, they're usually signing messages. They're saying something about. Uh, about the part of the system that they're working on um, in the form of uh, cryptographic signatures. So uh, any of these cryptographic signatures induces load on the system um, in terms of bandwidth and in terms of ultimately uh, computational processing, bringing them into and, and processing them on chain. Um, so we have these many participants but like N participants split across N shards and they're inducing load by their signatures. Um, and so we have a, the amount of signatures that we can handle uh, on the network and then ultimately aggregated on chain, um, put a barrier on the number of participants that we can have. And so we have a minimum safe committee size. We have a minimum safe, uh, and we have a minimum, and we have a number of shards that we're targeting and we have a number of signatures that we can handle. Uh, these are kind of the constraints that allow us to uh, form how many shards we're going to have. So I'll, I'll wrap that up real quickly. We have 1,024 shards, and we did this thing called cross-linking, which is the, the, bringing them back into the, the core consensus, uh, the beacon chain, 
um, on some time interval. Um, we were doing this once per shard every six minutes, um, which uh, put a barrier on the amount that these shards could communicate um, and know and learn about each other uh, because they essentially would learn about each other about every six minutes. Which application is that too slow for? You know, this was, it's based upon uh, much lead up into DevCon and many conversations at DevCon. This was the most concerning component, it's a lot of concerning components uh, because this is kind of a radical uh, shift in, in many core things. But based upon uh, conversations at DevCon, based upon some writings around the time, um, and specifically on this notion of um, composability uh, and the nature of like applications being able to compose uh, and communicate well, um, this, this six minute lag time pretty much across the board with application developers um, that we spoke with was kind of like a, not a non-starter, uh, but something people were extremely, extremely concerned about. Um, and so at DevCon, and those, those developers are, are the ones that are looking into payment schemes and immediacy and scaling to the level of Visa type of uh, stuff, or were that it, it was you know, probably so developers. Uh, a lot of it was probably uh, the DeFi community. Um, that's probably one of the more active uh, development and user communities, um, and they were very concerned about the composability of applications that they've they've begun to to know and love um, on ethereum um, in this new what would be seen as a kind of a high latency context um, and so um, based upon much of those conversations and and hearing that concern um, we swapped to a model that uh, crosslinks um, every shard every slot instead of every shard every um, epoch which is these like units of time within the protocol the 12 seconds versus six minutes um, and by cross-linking every slot we have um, essentially so we have 32 slots in an epoch um, if we cross-linked every shard every slot we can do like a certain amount of shards if we cross-link every shard every epoch we can do a certain amount of shards every slot and kind of like accumulate the amount of shards that we have in the system over the epoch. Um, but if we're, and each time you do that and it reduces load, uh, but if we're doing that every, um, crosslinking every shard, every slot, uh, then we need <clears throat> the load that we're inducing still can only get so high per slot. So we essentially divide the number of shards by the number of uh, slots in epoch to get the number of total shards that we can have, um, which is in that like, based upon the previous numbers is in that 32 to 64 range um, and opted for uh, the 64. Um, so it, it, it really comes down to how you configure a lot of these components in the system. Um, there's, there's a few different parameters you can kind of tune and twist. Uh, so there's a maximum load that the system can take based off of like primarily signatures because that's like mainly the message type, like the, the, the huge load message type in the system, um, validator signatures. Um, and you can kind of like play with, okay, if we have uh, if we have more shards, the latency between cross-linking and the race latency between communication and kind of bringing them back into the core consensus is going to be higher. If we have fewer shards, uh, we can reduce that latency. Um, and so overwhelmingly based off of uh, conversations, writings and things, primarily around DevCon, uh, we, we listened and uh, reformulated uh, how these shard chains communicate. And reduce the amount of shard chains, um, and that actually uh, that kind of shook things up a little bit with respect to timelines. Um, timelines are hard. Uh, building these things is hard. Specifying these things is hard, um, and uh, shaking up the spec specifications in November of 2019 um, certainly uh, you know pushed things back some amount of months. Um, but to meet, uh, you know, what is it, I think something that was very important for the community. One of the things that always inspired me from the beginning about Bitcoin was the 10 minute block time, which I thought was, was an immediate, uh, 
you know, sort of uh, cat and mouse play against against high frequency trading. So you have this block of time where a human can make a decision. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Right. And so there's there's always this dilemma. Yeah. That's that's going between human human parsable uh, decision making trees and then machine based decision trees. So we have all of our algorithms and <clears throat> bots and everything. So there's a constant play between servicing the needs of, uh, uh, or a game theory, or theoretical question about servicing the needs of high transaction throughput. Yeah. Yeah. Balancing that against, against malicious actors. Right. So the, the sharding, counter sharding playing with those numbers, right. And separating all of the participants in the network consensus out, uh, and and building them up to the top of the tree where the final consensus is reached. Yeah. Right. So that's interesting because you could you could make the the argument in the other way actually in that the longer the block time, the more the like the more the bot has time to figure out how to order the transactions to like mess with people. I guess specifically in terms of like minor front running and minor manipulation of uh, transactions uh, to to gain value. Um, there which is happening that is certainly happening on ethereum uh, people have run experiments and there's like a certain threshold of like uh value in transactions where miners will all of a sudden uh front run and manipulate things um and so i think the law the, figuring out how to front run is like likely uh likely np hard uh, in terms of like set packing and like trying and ordering and, and trying different combinations um, and so I think if you give somebody a really long time to make a block, you might have, you might have given them, uh, additional, uh, ways to pull value out of it. Um, but that wasn't necessarily your question. I don't know if you're, you had a question. No, no. I mean, I, I'm kind of treating it a little bit of it as, as a, as a provo provocative dialogue to give you a yeah, chance sure. to, to make the, the arguments. Uh, uh, for it, it's it, I'm I'm really not critical about it. I'm just trying to yeah, to sure. give you re sure. react. To it. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, okay, it, what it, I want to do is we've done the last eleven minutes, yeah, running down the structure of the of the shards and whatever. I want to come back and and ask you to to um, make the comparison to. Uh, to 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 Gavin's project and how it is that they're approaching that from a technical standpoint. Right. So I should probably know more about Polkadot, but I know that the fundamental um, and a lot like it's funny because if I talk to people from Polkadot, they're like vaguely aware of the deep technical CV2 uh, because we're honestly all pretty heads down. Um, we. There's certainly some more like share and interplay on um, some of the more researchy concepts um, like core consensus, um, witness reduction via polynomial commitments, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, but in terms of the nitty gritty of like what their protocol is actually building, I'm not deep in there. Um, but uh, their vision is a vision of heterogeneous sharding from my perspective, uh, whereas Ethereum's vision is more of um, homogenous sharding, um, meaning that they envision uh, kind of a core um, scalable consensus with validators and with random sampling across different portions of it um, to validate and handle the kind of linking and communication um, and security of a bunch of different types of shards. Uh, that have different execution models and different uh, maybe application specific things. Um, whereas Ethereum's sharded model uh, says, actually, we're going to have a unified uh, consensus across a unified set of shards, unified in terms of uh, their capabilities. Um, meaning we're going to put um, a general purpose kind of blockchain VM uh, state and execution um, that looks exactly the same across all these shards and facilitate the security and facilitate the communication between them. Uh, whereas they have more of a model where um, 
the plan is to have some sort of election in terms of uh, different types of chains that can be onboarded and brought in. So they might have a chain that looks very much like Ethereum. Um, they might have a chain that looks um, highly specific to um, gaming or to DeFi, things like that. Uh, I don't know exactly all the things in, in the works over there. Um, and it's, it's fundamentally a little bit of a different approach um, to what we, the vision of what is going to be useful um, and what is going to be a valuable tool to a decentralized um, world. And Ethereum takes this like very unopinionated route um, of we're going to have uh, general execution and computation um, that allows you to build and do whatever you want on all of these things in a, in a, in a very general way. Um, you know, the, the consensus uh, and, and in doing so, um, provide one of one of the benefits I, probably many, many benefits there um, one is that you don't really need um, you don't really need a governance structure for that uh, there is you know what looks like ethereum in times um, across the sharded protocol uh, in which you can build things like ethereum and there's communication and execution and kind of proofs against all the different portions of the system um, whereas when you start there, there is a limit to what these systems can do. Um, I, I talked a little bit about in terms of like the, the amount of load that you can process, the size of blocks, the um, amount of signatures in the system, the amount of validators in the system that you can randomly sample. Um, and so in either of these systems, there's going to be a maximum number of these like sub chains um, that can connect in uh, and be a part of the consensus. And so uh, by having heterogeneous sharding um, and by having a natural limit to the amount of uh, chains that can be connected into the system, uh, you must then decide which chains. Um, and, and so I think they have a, um, a kind of sophisticated on-chain governance structure uh, in which validators, I'm pretty sure validators, somebody can fact check me on that, uh, are the participants, uh, actually might, maybe it's just polka dot holders. Don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the dot holders are the governance uh, yeah, structure. Also don't decide which, that. which of these chains can kind of yeah. come in. Um, yeah. In a lot of the uh, Ethereum ethos, like we, we see this as a can of worms. Um, we see this as a game that can be manipulated and controlled uh, by the wealthy. And instead of giving kind of just like a baseline protocol for the world to um, utilize, opens up um, a whole type of issues that uh, we think that a protocol can be more pure and kind of live without. Um, I'm also a skeptic of the, um, you have a problem, throw a specific blockchain at it. Uh, I, I think that the, there's two reasons. One, um, and I, I think Polkadot won't suffer from this, uh, but one of the reasons is that an application specific blockchain all of a sudden has to have its own security. Um, and uh, we've seen even with blockchains like Ethereum Classic uh, that if you're not really uh, on the upper echelon of security these days, like you can be attacked um, and attacked for profit. Um, and well, I don't even get to that one. So, but, so two things. Uh, so the security, um, but in Polkadot's model, presumably uh, they have a similar security uh, consensus in that they're like sharding. They don't, I don't know if they're calling it sharding, but they're sharding, they're splitting, they're randomly sampling consensus participants. So ideally they can bring security to these chains and that's why they have a limit to the number of chains that can be there. Um, but uh, it's likely also gonna be a communications nightmare. Um, each of these chains can kind of have their own different communication protocol, their own proof scheme, their own um, different way they do things. Um, and in doing so, I think you, you actually, um, you make interoperability between portions of the system uh, much more difficult. Not impossible, um, but much more difficult. Um, and so those are the two drawbacks, maybe more, but uh, to these applications. Cool. Um, so yeah. let's, let's, let's segue into, on the, on the mention of the Ethereum Classic, we'll leave, we'll leave that issue on the side. Let's talk about, let's talk about the strategy uh, and thoughts behind 
the transition period between ETH1 and ETH2. So specifically from a security perspective, and secondly, since we talked about DeFi earlier and the, their requirements in the dialogue about, about sharding, let's talk about the, the aspect of, of, of the, you know, all of the DeFi applications in the switch. Let's so speak specifically to the positive sides, because everybody's looking at it very, very negatively. Yeah, yeah. Positive sides in the design, uh, in the design, both in the spec and in and in the thought, in transitioning DeFi apps to 2.0. The direction is uh, certainly to, especially so. Something we haven't really mentioned is uh, since DevCon, there's been like this beautiful move, movement on Ethereum 1x or Ethereum that we know and love today. Um, focused on bringing statelessness to Ethereum as like a way to manage state, a way to manage uh, sync, a way to open up to all sorts of ranges of different types of nodes so rather than just being a full node, maybe partially full node or light nodes. Um, and there's, this is an incredible movement. Um, and this actually is like a prerequisite um, for, so E2 is a, as designed today, is a, um, a stateless protocol stateless and with respect to these these shard chains and we won't get into the nuance there right now um but the um so ethereum right now is uh working on getting ready to to move into uh into eth2 um the stateless movement on ethereum uh gets eth1 chain uh ready to be slotted in as relatively unchanged um, in that the EVM exists, uh, the state exists, the communications between applications exist. Um, Ethereum as, uh, as you see today, primarily once it's moved to stateless, can be placed into this ETH2 context. We're working on prototyping this today um, without uh, significant breaking changes. Um, and so, this uh and now you're in a scalable you're in a proof of stake context in which you have access to all these like scalable the scalable data um which you can do really cool things with so the migration path um for ethereum for eth1 is um not necessarily going to be that painful um painful maybe from uh some of the software development perspective and engineering perspective um painful potentially and by painful i mean work to do uh there's work to do in engineering there's that's a very very design. good thing to point out um, a, lot, a big reason for the resistance is people say i've we've invested x x years yeah. in, in getting to here and now we're going to have to refactor and and rehook and damn it why should we do that work again well that, and, and that's that's kind of the the look ethereum 2 is a moving a moving target uh like i'm sorry that's just a fact um and it's a moving target because the research is ongoing. Um, a lot of the core research is certainly in place. Uh, we're not changing the consensus model today. We're not changing the core beacon chain today. Um, but the research is a moving target, as well as the dialogue and, and understanding the needs of the community. And I, like that is the most abstract, like bullshit thing you can say, is, like the needs of the community. But like, let me tell you, over the past two years, this has been a conversation amongst tons and tons of people in which like the <clears throat> direction and roadmap and things has changed to, to like meet and better understand the needs, of, the needs of the community. I mean, for one, there was a talk 18 months ago of like some people were throwing out, well, maybe we'll just let the existing Ethereum chain die. And it's like, I don't even know why, why that was ever thrown out, but it was thrown out as like a viable thing. Like, oh, we'll just go into ETH2 and like the other thing will die and whatever. But like w the... <clears throat> the humanist like we've realized that uh the humanist approach the like approach that leverages ethereum and what is incredibly valuable today is the applications the developers the users the community and all the fucking tooling like throwing any of that out the window is like <clears throat> there's there's no need to do that um and so the roadmap has continually um and i use this word uh 
think Casey from the EWASM team first really used it in this context. Like this, this is a humanist upgrade. Um, this is a Ethereum first upgrade. This is a, um, and this is a, this is an upgrade, right? Like I, <clears throat> with the migration of ETH1 into what is, just what is a new contract, it is an upgrade. A humanist upgrade. What is, what, is, what are you using humanist to the, to, uh, I understand the term. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, so it, it's probably probably a, a, a bastardization of, of that term, but it's a human first. Um, it is uh, the humans that make up Ethereum. I mean, there's 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 a lot of things for why Ethereum is, is valuable, but like one of the core things is because people build on it, because people like on it, like it, because people hang out and talk about it, because um, it, the asset is is distributed across all these humans because uh, these applications and, and the humans actually use them. Like you can go build a blockchain and put a bunch of applications on it, but there's no humans there. There's, there's nothing. That's for me, the core argument between the Bitcoin maximalists and, and what, uh, what Ethereum is. It's like, okay, Bitcoin was set in motion. Here's the protocol. That's it. And we have to follow it. And Ethereum comes from this point. Hey, wait a second. There's actually people that are that are interacting with this, and we need to take that into account. And and it's primarily why I migrated out of the Bitcoin space into the Ethereum space is that willingness to recognize an experiment, but that the fact that it's human centric. So right. I wanted you to I wanted you to to be able to state that clearly. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. And, and so the <clears throat> over the past two years, I mean, first. First, oh, it was a lot of like technical, like we can do this, we can build this thing. Um, but then the, the, what this thing is had to fit the needs of the humans. And so like the continual uh, refabrication and re redirection of this thing uh, into like its current form has been uh, to facilitate and figure out how to make this like fantastic thing that we can build facilitate the existing Ethereum community. So this is this is an upgrade. This is an upgrade for the humans. Um, we knew that we needed an upgrade before CryptoKitties, uh, but then CryptoKitties all of a sudden everyone knew we needed an upgrade. Well, let's um, talk and, about that. Let's talk about that great conversation between John Lilich and and Vitalik, where he said, you know, we knew it wasn't going to scale from the beginning, and everybody's going, "Oh, you launched and sold us a token that we you knew wasn't going to do what you wanted it to do." And Bitcoin doesn't either. <laughs> that's not a scalable payment solution um and they just changed the narrative instead of changing the protocol right um we're trying like we have people we have demands we have like we have this like vision of what we want we want like a highly scalable general purpose decentralized computation machine for the world and like we're gonna fucking make it happen right like they wanted a payment they wanted a, a digital decentralized payment solution and they said you know what fuck that it's gold um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I remember when, so, so I, I was the first person that ever tweeted about Ethereum when, 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 uh, Vitalik posted on his blog and I'd been following him from Bitcoin magazine days and he put this up and I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I had seen in the forums that he got kicked out by all the, by all the Bitcoiners. People forget that originally this was a suggestion to, to, to basically amplify the scripting capabilities of Bitcoin. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's there's these arguments that have that have gone around in circles at, for 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 a long period of time, and you know this. Uh, I really like the 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 moving target uh, quote that you did. I just I just posted that. You know, no apologies for being a moving moving target. Um, it's a constant state of de of development. But what we haven't but we have what we haven't covered in that question, and and uh, we have seven minutes left for you to for you to do that. Is to talk to the DeFi developers because you've talked right. conceptually now about the the motivation, but specifically give me some technical jargon for the DeFi crowd about what it is that they can expect in improvement because you talked about the you know the disadvantages for it. So right. So what you can expect an improvement um, scale. Um, well, one uh, I think an improved security profile, uh, and two. Um, which is ultimately valuable. Ethereum today on proof of work hasn't been attacked, um, but which maybe we're lucky. Maybe there's enough. Uh, maybe there's enough value there. Um, but ideally, more decentralization in the core consensus and more security. Um, but more specifically, in terms of application development experience, um, 
we are currently seeing a uh, a revolution in the layer two, and I'm 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 a layer like I'm not, I'm not a skeptic of layer two, uh, but anytime someone tells me they have uh, a, a layer two solution that's going to work um, and going to solve all our problems, I've seen it, I've heard it enough that I'm like. I don't know, man. Like, so, so Jacob, Jacob uh, from from Raiden's gonna gonna be here uh, later in the day. Great, I'm, yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I, I hope people start using this thing. But I, I we we've seen uh, we've seen these things take much longer. Everything takes a long time. This thing's hard. Uh, we've seen these things take much longer than expected, and we've seen um, adoption to be tough. And we and we've also seen complexities arise, especially in like state channels. State channels are hard. State channels are really hard to develop. Um, and so, but I'm very, I'm increasingly optimistic about all this roll-up business, about all this, essentially a lot of the complexities, um, lie in, in some of these scaling solutions and like data availability of, of, of things that are off chain and in, in this layer two. Um, and so I, I only have so much time. Um, I'm a fan of these roll-ups. I think that they're going to bring awesome things to us. Um, but in this in this world in which we have Ethereum in the sharded context, and we have a fuck ton of data on um, these shards. We can scale these roll-ups massively. Um, and so in these in this layer two context, uh, we can do single chained uh, like <clears throat> sequential operation like we already have in DeFi, uh, but in a more highly scalable context. Um, in a world in which we have execution across multiple of these, multiple of these shard chains, um, some of the coding paradigm would have to change um, if you're leveraging uh, execution across shard chains. And that, that's, just, that's just a fact. Um, and so I'm actually, I'm very excited about these rollups because you can uh, leverage things in a, in a kind of a similar, almost the exact same uh, context the exact same kind of like parad uh, computational paradigm, yes. paradigm so don't today. listen to adler's talk uh later because he's going to be he's going to be talking uh, uh about yeah. about this fuel stuff, and this stuff's fuel. huge and when you give it 63 shard chains of data the stuff's like even huger um but it, if and as we have execution across multiple shards um there some of the some of the coding paradigms are going to change, and so you can have you can take your DeFi apps that you know and love, you can deploy them on a shard, and they can do things within a shard. Um, but certain types of applications um, and more sophisticated applications can and will leverage a uh, multi-sharded paradigm. Um, there will be uh, new programming, uh, new additional programming paradigms in this context, like as async and stuff. Like we're figuring it out um, in other contexts and modules. So I think. Um, some of these programming paradigms are probably reported, um, and the, that there will be some. There, if if people are going to use this multi-sharded paradigm for execution, there might there there will be some pain. Um, but that doesn't mean that the things that you've worked on today uh, go out the window. It doesn't mean that the um, complex applications that we built on Ethereum today go out the window. It just means that we have more opportunity. Um, it means that we can now do um, more and more exciting things across these shards, um, and so. Really, it's it kind of expands the scope of what is possible. Um, it does not uh, narrow that, right? Like everything that you can do today can continue to be done, um, but you're going to like Ethereum is going to hit its limit. So moving into these roll-up chains is a huge opportunity there, um, and uh, working over time on cross shard chain computation and communication, uh, there's also a huge opportunity there. And so both are going to be explored and pushed on, um, but nothing. None of the hard work and the excellent work and the awesome stuff going on today is going to be just thrown out the window. I, I I agree with you too about about all of the teams, right? There's what six clients uh, that are in active development now. Yeah, it depends on the day, uh, but but yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, let's see if I can listen. Uh, Nimbus, Prism, Lighthouse, uh, Teku. Trinity Nethermind, I think those are the, those are the, yeah. oh, and, and Lodestar, Lodestar. Um, so each of them kind of have, there, there's a few that are like really getting close to that production readiness, working on multi-client test nets. Uh, there's a few like Lodestar is like very focused on just enhancing the JavaScript ecosystem. Like uh, people are using their stuff to build block explorers and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, Teku is taking like more of the enterprise play with consensus, um, but everyone's kind of got their own thing, different languages, pretty cool.
Yeah. So yeah, talk. We'll just use the time until Zach shows up, man. Because yeah. you know, let's um, yeah, we can dream. Let's let's talk about those. Uh, let's talk about each of those implementations. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, on the, who's leading the pack, not in terms of, of tech, but in terms of implementation? In no particular order, um, Nimbus Prismatic and uh, Lighthouse, in terms of being ready, in terms of having their test nets, in terms of having people play with them, uh, they're, they're at the front of the pack. Um, and so certainly those three, uh, when, we, when we go to mainnet, are going to be um, highly used, uh, recommend. Uh, trying them all out kind of during this phase. Um, and close behind, I would say, Teku, um, they had a, a little bit of personnel change last year, and so they, they lost a little bit of time, but they're rapidly approaching. I think if they are not uh, ready the day of mainnet, uh, they're going to be in kind of like a sophisticated alpha or beta. Um, and then Lodestar, um, They've actually, we never really expected them to be production ready in terms of like efficiency, uh, computational efficiency, but they've made like huge, crazy gains recently um, using some some research and, and algorithms uh, written by Proto Lambda. Um, so they actually, they might get the efficiency to get there, uh, but they're, again, their they're targets like really like making everything into these beautiful JavaScript modules uh, to kind of enhance and enable the, the developer ecosystem. Um, Nethermind showed up late to the party. They've done a really excellent job on their ETH1 client, um, so I expect good things out of them, um, but I don't know exactly their timeline. Um, Trinity uh, is one that like, we at the research team kind of like use to prototype and test things, um, and is gonna have some, uh, probably some efficiency problems. Uh, so we'll see uh, how it makes its way, if it makes its way fully to, to mainnet, uh, but it, it kind of serves as a, as a test bed um, for us. I think that was all of them. Um, and so, a lot of really great things, a lot of like diverse skill set, um, people trying things in different ways, people just implementing things, uh, different algorithms in different ways, uh, kind of brings to this like diversity and robustness to mainnet. Um, one thing that we really hope to get out of them um, is uh, the, especially in early days, uh, some of these clients might have DOS vectors. Um, which we saw in the Shanghai DOS attacks back in Ethereum 20, I don't know, a while ago. Um, and uh, guess, I think there was actually DOS attacks on uh, primarily with a guess, but maybe they even found one in parity, but the network stayed up because um, even though uh, one client was kind of being DOSed off, the other clients, uh, the other client was able to, to keep up. And so um, we hope in that like implementation from different angles and different trying different uh, things that um, although the attack surface is kind of increased from some perspective because you have many more things to attack, uh, the system, the overall like distributed system uh, as a whole becomes more robust because even if you attack this, this one component, uh, you know, 70% of the network can still keep running. Um, and so there's some, some cool things we get out of that client diversity. I know uh, some people are like, why are we, one, why would we fund all these clients? Why do we need all these clients? Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons. I mean, and the other reason is that like, Two years ago, 18 months ago, whenever we started this thing, it's been forever. Uh, there, there's also, it was unclear, like, you know, what, who was going to do really, who was going to do a really good job, you know, who, and so it, it's not putting all your eggs in one, one, uh, one team. It's not like hiring one team internal to build everything. It's like, um, kind of like allowing um, the community to grow more organically and, and allowing there to be more um, ability to experiment and more ability to, to test and try to always continue. Messaging Zach on Twitter, DMs. <laughs> I'll have like all them up on Telegram. You, do you have them on Telegram? I don't have them on Telegram. Yeah, I can. Uh, Ping on Telegram and tell him that you're taking that you're eating up his time. <laughs> <laughs> I love this fractured communication world. Oh my God, yeah. there's so many. Uh, here's a, here's another part of this whole like shift to to 2.0 and the DeFi world because I think this is a this is a good one because it's been a it's been a long uh, it's been a long dialogue <clears throat> or set of arguments uh, online and we've got Mariano Conti from from Maker uh, coming on on Sunday um, yeah Sunday Sunday evening so it actually be our time so it'll be daytime for your time. Oh, cool. um, Let's 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 talk about that one. Let's talk about 
you know, potential, what are the potential changes to, to, to what Maker's doing, right? Uh, how, how do you see that transition happening on 1020 uh, for Maker specifically? Yeah. So if we, um, if the route of kind of single execution chain, multiple data chains is, is followed and people are using rollups, then, um, you know, Maker would still exist on this like layer one context, uh, the, the core mechanics of like making die and uh, the, the loans or the vaults, whatever they call them these days. Um, and die would just be used as like a derivative asset on these um, rollup chains. Um, and, and kind of bringing utility into there. In terms of a uh, multi-sharded execution um, standpoint, uh, I believe likely you'd have uh, the core of Maker exist on one chain, um, and but rewrite the token contract such that these tokens instead of uh, <clears throat> so tokens are tokens are kind of written in that there's a single contract. Um, and you're just referencing balances in this contract, but a multi-sharded paradigm, um, which you want to move these tokens across shards, likely you have like each token or like wallet of tokens is some sort of like derivative contract from some, some sort of parent contract. And so that you can move these individual assets. Um, and so if we, uh, if we went that path, um, likely the, the die version of the token to be moved across like a multi-sharded paradigm would have to be uh, migrated into this, what would need to be like an ERC 2020 or some, some modified uh, token standard. Um, I, again, like I premise this with like the integration of ETH1 into ETH2 with the scalable data layers, like what is imminent um, and it requires very little changes. Um, things that uh, migrating into like a multi uh, sharded, multi execution paradigm, um, I would say it would be on the far horizon and something that, uh, over the next blank amount of time would be uh, like the standards and how, how to work in there would be um, talked about and figured out more. Um, but uh, definitely want to be talking to these guys more. Um, you know, if you're, if you're working on apps and dApps and you have thoughts about uh, the direction of Ethereum and thoughts about what things look like or could look like or things you're concerned about in the multi sharded paradigm, um, hit us up. What's the what's the best channel for that? <laughs> um, so many channels. Twitter's okay. Twitter's okay to like at least like say hey and 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 go from there. Um, but we actually have this great. Uh, so last year we made this uh, East two O um, Discord server. Uh, but in the past month, it's become the East R and D Discord server with the unification of the East One X uh, Stateless Ethereum. Um, movement all that conversation is happening so it's really like the protocol uh protocol discussion like all the research all the all the specs all the stuff i think that that would you know if there was enough interest to talk about um dApps in this new context um in there like we we can make some channels um just show up uh show up talk on our main channels and we'll go from there um it's actually especially even more so probably more pressing on the, the stateless ethereum um is to move into the stateless context, there are a few, there are a couple of, uh, I don't know exactly what these are, I have an idea, but I won't speak too much to them. There's a couple of breaking changes that need to happen in there. Um, and so I think engaging on that topic is probably much more pressing uh, than on the multi-sharded topic right now. Um, I'll drop a link to that Discord real quick. Cool. What were the other things that you had in your notes? Uh, um... In your outline, I literally wrote what, why, when, who, and how. <laughs> those, those are my notes. Um, then we haven't talked at all about how. Yeah, yeah. We did a um, lot about why. We did a lot about why. Let's talk about how, let's talk about how. Yeah. So the how the how mixes in with the, a little bit of the who, and I, I talked about I gave I gave that shout out. There's tons of people working on this thing, um, but the how is the how is fascinating, um, and the how is like. I don't even know, um, but uh, I, I would I definitely recommend uh, Ben Edgington wrote an article, um, the, the something about the bazaar and, and, and how um, how this this process, although with um, with the EF and with 
certainly with Vitalik kind of leading uh, the vision um, and leading some of the core research, uh, but it is really this like fantastic development model where we have people all over the world contributing, um, like random people showing up, finding a bug, fixing things, um, contributing to the research openly on ETH research. I mean, this thing's, it, 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 it's kind of like, it, it doesn't feel so radical because I'm, I'm, I just do it every day. Uh, but if you take a step back, like it's kind of a, it's kind of a radical development process and, and, you know, it probably has some similarities to maybe how Linux is developed. Um, but, but even then, I think, um, the amount of people that have their hands in this, uh, is, is, well, I, I can't speak to the Linux process, but there's, there's, there's a lot of people and, and the, like, the democratization of it, like, if you have something solid to contribute, you just show up and you talk. You show up and you, you write, you show up, you, you find issues, you show up, you make a proposal. And like, we're all just listening and talking and engaging with all of this. And like the, the how is uh, distributed. The how is uh, by many standards uh, decentralized. And, and the how is like totally online and across the entire globe at all times. There's somebody probably working on, there's certainly somebody working on Ethereum at every moment of every day. Um, but there's there's certainly probably somebody working on ETH2 at every moment of every day, um, you know, and and that's why I'm up at like four in the morning talking to y'all. It's like there's it it, it it's it's all it's it's like I said. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people in the teams. Yeah. Yeah. And I just know how they're. I I mean I've been on, I've been in it on the calls. I haven't done that in the last months, but last year I was in on the on the on the calls. And watching what was going on, everybody's just got their heads down in their own little in their own little pond and are building and implementing, iterating, and you guys are communicating with each other. So, you know, it's just not it's really not it's, and they're also not the people that that do social media, right? Um, <laughs> right. The the what you see on Twitter is like only a very limited glimpse into the iceberg of and maybe like that's the dirty tip of the iceberg of the actual like beautiful ice structures underneath the underneath the water. ETH research is like in the past two years become this incredible resource. Um, and this is this is where ideas first usually like deep ideas first show, usually show up um, for initial discussion, initial like not a spec, just like um, you know, an algorithm or a new way to think about something, maybe a new direction. Um, a lot of stuff shows up there. And then uh, we have this ETH 2 specs repo. Um, where when ideas are ready to be sculpted into something like actually uh, actionable uh, with respect to uh, ETH2, um, they move into there. Um, and there's specs on like core state transition. There's specs on like what a validator does. Um, there's specs on uh, the structure of, of data and hashing. Um, there's specs on, on the P2P layer, how communications happen, what gossip channels there are, the validation conditions there. Um, and that's that's kind of that's where a lot of the core around like forming the concrete what concrete uh, what East two is um, in issues and PRs uh, a lot of engagement there um, we have this East two uh, sorry it's the East R and D Discord channel um, this used to be I think just like a single getter and linked to a Telegram channel uh, but it, it it outgrew that and has many channels. Um, it, it now also has all like the stateless Ethereum uh, and state sync research is all going on in there. Uh, so like this is this is it's huge. It's very cool. A lot of um, a lot of exciting conversations going on there. Um, and then um, there's like infinitely many other channels where people are just like bouncing ideas around on. Um, you know, t Twitter Twitter is where we go to like post updates um, and where some people go to like argue about stupid things uh but the main the, the real conversations are happening um in these like technical forums and on this discord let me okay cool so i've got one question that came in uh on the discord chat uh which i think is a really good one uh from uh stefan at at ether risk how the research and development is being funded so we know that there's there's ethereum grants uh, that have that have gone out to different teams. Most people aren't aware of that because it happened pretty early. Uh, and then that those grants have also gone out to teams that are supported by other entities. Like for example, the Nimbus implementation is also supported by Status. Um, 
give us a little bit of an overview about about what it is that you know about how those two yeah yeah and public uh, good financing things are happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the the for one, the EF has a stack of cash to help serve the community. Um, from Genesis, I think that we're probably aware of that. Uh, and the the grants uh, grants really there are a few grants before the beginning of 2018, but the grants team and the the um, what they call the ecosystem support team um, has really grown over the past few years to become like a full fledged program. They don't publish enough. They actually published something recently about like all the shit they did in 2019. They don't publish enough. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of money going out the door towards awesome projects. Okay, um, so I'm going to interject there because it's a perfect opportunity for me to do something that I promised Ken. <laughs> and keep the thought where you are. So people, please please go to ecosystem.support and check out what it is that they're doing. Check out the grants application form, which which is really granular and really super, yeah? Um, I was, when I was asking ecosystem support to get involved with non-con and with space, they were saying, why? And I, I came back and I said, because not enough people know about ecosystem, what ecosystem support is doing. The, all of the stuff happened early, um, but this is a great way for for, for developers uh, and researchers to get funding from a very very open program. I mean, the the breadth of what it is that they do yeah. and, fund and is, these guys are tr like I talked I talked to them the other day. Their biggest thing they're trying to do is how to get more applications in the door so they can get more allocations so they can get they can give people more money. You know, right. so like that's what we're talking about, about here. Life. Go to ecosystem.support, check out the awesome page. It's very descriptive. It's incredibly user-friendly and a great interface to get into the grants program and not have to go after VC for the stuff that you're developing. Yeah. Ecosystem.support. Cool. Yeah. So, so, right where you were with your Okay, so so this grants program exists. Uh, they don't publish enough. Um, we actually uh, with a few a handful of the grantees. There's not just the grants at the beginning. These have been uh, repeat grants. Um, so approximately every six months, uh, we're giving waves of funding to these leading clients uh, to make sure that they have the resources they need uh, to continue forward. Some of this is co-funded, right? So ChainSafe partially funds uh, their Lodestar effort. Um, status co-funds one-to-one. Uh, there's great value in, in uh, the, the grants that you have are giving there. Um, Prismatic, uh, Prismatics had like an incredible time uh, raising money. Uh, not well, not not raising money, but, but soliciting um, donations, soliciting Gitcoin grants. Um, they got a, a, a donation from Vitalik at some point. Um, Lighthouse, the Sigma Prime guys, they're also a security firm. Um, they're awesome. If you need stuff audited, if you need systems, uh, like they'll, they'll do smart contract auditing. They do like systems uh, auditing, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so they, we, the EF. Uh, funds them, but they also partially fund themselves. Um, some of them are related to other organizations, like Consensus funds funds a client. Trinity's funded internally. Uh, Nethermind, I think they have. Uh, they're working on like a business on their own to do some product offerings to also fund. But I think the EF has given them some partial funding as well. Um, and so it's a little bit of a mix, and it's something that we hope um, on the medium to longer term horizon uh, that these. Uh, clients do become self-sustainable. Obviously, like maybe that's a pipe dream. Um, you know, the EF will continue to fund uh, clients as much as they it can uh, for as long as it can. But the uh, ideally, we have some sort of you know, like the adjunct model where like you're you're a company that provides services X Y and also provide kind of a, as an additional benefit to the community and and like to demonstrate your expertise, you like also help and build and maintain this client. Um, there's there's also some other like interesting funding models that people are tossing around and hopefully we get some good experimentation um, in the next couple of years uh, to get some self-sustainability. But um, the, yeah, what are those? the EF is there. Um, <clears throat> so there's been a few things thrown out. Uh, like for example, having a strong default in your, uh, in your client that like 0.5% of transaction fees uh, get sent to the client. Like I could go in and, and, and edit it uh, but I also know that it that's like a tiny amount and uh, it would go to the sustainability of like the software and things that I'm building. Um, another thing people toss around is like some sort of that, but on a on a similar like for validator rewards. These things 
um, are not, I, I actually really, I think the transaction fee is, is, is pretty palatable um, and something that I would love to see people experiment with. So I've got two, two good questions for you. The first one uh, comes from, uh, um, from Buddha.eth, B-U-T-T-A dot ETH. And that is, will the foundation cooperate with hardware wallets to make ETH2 keys accessible from day one, or what is the plan? So the BLS standard is only, the, so we're using um, a new signature scheme. Um, this is called, uh, they're BLS signatures, and they use a curve called BLS 1231. Those are different BLs and Ss on each of those, so it's really confusing, but we just call them BLS. We use BLS signatures. Uh, they're the new, new awesome magic signatures that allow for aggregation. Uh, but in that, uh, we've been working with a group, um, a distributed group of, uh, there's like some professors of the blockchain driving this like IETF uh, BLS standard so that we can like agree on a common standard um, on the internet so that we can like use the same software and things like that. Um, but to that end, uh, does not have uh, support in any hardware wallet that I'm aware of. Um, I, we have been knocking on doors uh, to make sure that these hardware wallets are familiar and aware that this is something that uh, not only the Ethereum blockchain, but many blockchains and other applications outside of blockchains are begin, going to begin to use. Um, and so they know that there is um, a kind of a financial uh, motivation for them to, to get this thing to get this thing right. Um, so I don't, unfortunately, I really don't expect hardware wallets to support them, uh, say in two months. Um, I do, I'm pretty optimistic that hardware wallets might support them in six months. I'm gonna ask you the, the second question now. Why was the minimum ETH to start off the beacon chain decreased to minus 500K? And what are your expectations about how users will behave in the first days once the deposit contract is deployed? Yeah, cool. So initially, I think there was a 2 million ETH uh, threshold um, to get the chain started. Um, it was, this, <clears throat> this was relatively high uh, to avoid um, things like early, early capture where maybe like some, a whale shows up, takes control over the entire beacon chain and like locks it and nobody else can do deposits or something like that. Um, there's like some nefarious scenarios that we don't want to happen. And so we want that, that threshold behind us. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns um, with with the initial launch of E2 um, with respect to just like there, <clears throat> as a you know say I have X ETH um, available like I might not like stake all X ETH on day zero uh, because like I want to like figure out how the software works I want to like get slowly kind of ramp things up and so we do we do expect there to be like a little bit of a timidness I mean we, we hope to be, there to be an excitement because uh, I it is incredibly exciting, but we do expect to be like a limited little, there could be a potentially be a limit, a little bit of timidness with respect to capital. Um, and so <clears throat> that threshold was decreased knowing uh, two things. Um, one, if there is early capture, um, <clears throat> it would be abundantly obvious. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, as a community, coordinate and fork out the ETH that uh, did capture and um, everyone would get like a little bit of bonus because there'd be less ETH supply. Um, so fuck that guy. But <clears throat> another thing is that this is, this is, a, this is a minimum threshold. Um, so the, there's two parameters that we set at Genesis. Um, well, there's a ton of parameters, but there's two parameters that define when Genesis starts. One is a date. So the, the minimum date that Genesis can start. And the other is this, this threshold. And so it's whenever both are met first. Um, but so we can actually prior to that date, much more ETH than that 500,000 ETH could show up. Um, and so we could have a million ETH of Genesis. Um, or we could have that 500,000 or we could have 10 million. Um, it, it really depends on the amount of ETH that shows up to that deposit contract prior to that date. If that minimum threshold is not met before that date, then once that date happens, once the minimum threshold hits, it, it, it happens. So um, it, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, obviously, 500,000 ETH is much less secure than two, two million um, by a factor of four. Uh, but it uh, <clears throat> it allows us a little bit more flexibility in getting things started um, in a little bit more conservative fashion. Uh, the cool thing is the early adopters. Like I think the the interest, sorry, the um, the rewards, like the amount of rewards you can get at that point, that is like something like 20 something percent 
um, when there's only 500,000 ETH staked. Uh, and so hopefully, even if we have like a low participation, um, hopefully it's uh, hobbyists, hopefully it's like believers that are like having having a, a, a good time securing the network and, and getting uh, getting paid well for it. And how do the mechanics of, oh, um, what do I expect to happen when the deposit founder is deployed? Um, it depends on how close it's deployed to the intended genesis date. Uh, so if it's like five days before the genesis date, I expect it to be a mad rush. Um, if it's like a month and a half before the genesis date, um, probably like a little bit of a trickle. Um, hopefully, um, you know, may maybe uh, some uh, significant community, mem community members might make like a public deposit just to like virtue signal like I'm in. Um, but it, I'm, I'm not, I, we'll see. So let me ask you another another question that that perfectly segues into that um, is is how will the ETH uh, ETH that's deciding not to stake transition to ETH two? Is there going to be a separate deposit contract, or what 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 do you envision for that? So, yeah, so the 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 migration. So um, ETH ETH is ETH. Uh, whether you're in uh, the existing Ethereum chain or whether you're validating in this new consensus context. Um, you know, you're just, you've kind of changed the state of the ETH, you've moved from X to Y, uh, but the, um, the migration path today is uh, certainly the integration of ETH1 and ETH2. Um, and so if you validate, you become a validator, you're in this new context. Um, otherwise, at this point of this hard fork in which the ETH1 consensus is swapped for ETH2 consensus, um, meaning all of a sudden the beacon chain and the validators are securing building the ETH1 chain rather than the miners, um, at that point, you would just exist in this new context. You don't have to do anything. So if you're validating, you essentially move into this new context early um, for the chance to secure, um, you know, put your capital at stake at risk to secure the protocol for a chance of rewards. Um, and if you don't do anything, you'll just show up in ETH2 at a hard fork. Okay, so I mean, let, let's let's talk about the whales then for, the, for, for a bit. Yeah, so, so the argument is made is that you know the average use, ETH user, or let's say DApp developer that wants to wants to stake in has a stretch, um, and the ETH whales it's an it's an easy it's an it's an easy stretch. It's even just like pocket change. Yeah, um, these are obvious arguments. Okay, so the difference be between the oligarchy of crypto and 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 the um, you know participators of crypto, there's a huge space in between those two extremes how do we build the middle class of ethereum okay because it's also a societal question we've 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 killed the middle class what do you see as a potential um um uh, uh incentive mechanism or a messaging structure that we can build an ethereum middle class and move away from these two extremes that we have Whew. so <clears throat> A nice property of proof of stake, and this is this isn't this isn't going to build a middle class, right? But this is this is a nice property that I think at least democratizes the participation in the system. Um, in proof of work, if you don't have access to, especially in these like uh, ASIC worlds, if you don't have access to uh, like intimate access to supply chains. If you don't have a ton of capital uh, available to participate in uh, like going direct manufacturer, being like super integrated in these supply chains, then you're getting hardware that like has been mined on already and is last generation, and you're not going to be able to get the same return on your capital as someone who has a lot of capital. Whereas in proof of stake, uh, the asset is highly liquid and highly available. The asset to participate. And so, do you think that we'll see an increase in staking pool participation? Is that one avenue where we can increase the middle class? So certainly, um, staking like it is. To participate in a mining staking pool, you have to actually get a miner. And, and if, once you get that miner uh, and you're not embedded in the supply chain, the return you're getting on that miner, the amount of hush power you have per like capital that you've locked up um, is going to be lower than, than, than the whales. So the nice thing about staking pools, the nice thing about participating even at lower than that 32 ETH increment in a staking pool um, does allow you to kind of seek the same return on capital as somebody who has a lot of capital in terms of percentage. Um, and so at least you don't have like, as much of an accelerating, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I'm super wealthy, I'm from a whale and I can get 10% of my money, and, but the guy with uh, five ETH can only get 5% of his money, that's like, that's, that's worse than, <laughs> that disparity is much worse than if, um, 
a guy can, everyone can get 10% of their money. Um, and so there's a little bit of a, 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 a more equitable ability to build wealth depending on the wealth that you have, but that doesn't necessarily solve like the fundamental wealth disparity. Um, it solves the democratization of uh, like equitable financial assets, uh, which even in like the traditional world with Wall Street, um, like the more money you have, the more money you can make in terms of like, obviously that's always in terms My of- My mom used to always say it takes money to make money. Right. And 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 in, in these decentralized uh, crypto economic consensus protocols, it does take money to make money, but hopefully the amount of, the percentage of money you can make on your money is equitable across the amount of money you have. Uh, whereas like, whereas in, instead in, in a lot of traditional financial instruments, the more money you have, the higher percentage yield that you can actually get. And that's, that's obviously not always true, uh, but that's very frequently true. Um, and so the democratization, making this software uh, easy to use uh, for hobbyists, uh, there's some cool research going on funded by the Lighthouse team right now. They're doing a lot of usability research. There was a blog post that was posted yesterday. They're working on uh, building um, a more user-friendly staking interface. Um, and they've, they've contracted with uh, a design and research team who is, uh, my Discord failed to send. I'll drop it in a second. Um, they're working on design and research team that is um, you know, building and like doing research with potential validators to build a good uh, staking interface so that you not only do you not have to have tons of capital to participate in the system, but you don't necessarily have to have you know the chops to be able to go in and look at like blogs coming off of a, a command line interface. Um, you know they want to make things simple and easy, and, and that, that's that's an important component. Um, you know another important important component is that you don't need highly sophisticated uh, hardware to run this stuff. Um, that's a design requirement. Is that like a consumer machine, a standard consumer machine, um, should be able to participate with you know somewhere between 32 and 320, you know, at least one validator, 32 ETH, um, maybe like as up to up to 320 um, ETH, 10 validators um, on a single consumer machine. You know, that's a very important component for the, the decentralization and kind of democratization of the software. Um, but how to build the middle class, that's a, I think that's a, a question that's uh, deeper than, uh, you know, tuning, tuning the parameters of the software, unfortunately. So that's a social question. Um, I'm not necessarily saying the middle class. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you need a revolution. The middle class as a as a as a simile, you know, in, in inside of the crypto economy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, some of that is like uh, having you know growing not only not only in the the core kind of like proof of stake consensus mechanisms, but growing uh, opportunity within the system I mean, within. Well, within the system and within the ecosystem, um, you know, I, I've, I've, it's been awesome to see not only uh, developers uh, that are like really into this ecosystem find jobs and get be able to get involved in the past like couple of years, but uh, more and more I see uh, engaged community members that have not so much of a technical background finding their place in uh, working on protocols, working at the Ethereum Foundation, working on um, <clears throat> you know working at different companies, um, you know, and I. I the more that we can grow opportunity outside of just uh, being a developer in this ecosystem, I think that is that is coming and that is growing. Uh, you know, the more that we can kind of bring people into the fold. Doesn't it blow your mind that we have this whole complete parallel economy in ten years? <laughs> um, it it is pretty crazy. It, it's like sometimes I'm unsure what the end game is. Right? Is it is the end game? Uh, does the whole world move over to something like this, um, or is it? Does it like? Is is it kind of an alt society uh, for like the digitally native or the people that think otherwise? You know, does it, does it become? Uh, Depends on what time frame you want to think in, right? So, sure. if you want to talk about that end game question, is this going to be the thing that that the that the that the world uses? I do think that. Our goal should be that what we build is co-opted by nation states and implemented for transparency and efficiency and to, at yeah, the, and to pull corporate power back into the social sphere where it is that all profits are not uh, uh, privatized and all costs are socialized. Right. Yeah. So I like seeing the way it is that Ethereum enterprise is being adopted. People are, you know, announcing their projects that are actually right. Ethereum. 
My hope is, is that at some point, larger economic blocks, like let's say the EU or, or you know, NAFTA or whatever it is, come together and say, okay, this is what it is that we're going to use for a portion of our economy. That would be the solution that I would like to see as the end game, that what we've done is co-opted. But I think that we're 10, 20, 30 years away from that because the trajectory of the past and the current state of the present has its, has its running time. So if those, that's the way that I see it. Are we aligned on that or do you see a different sort of trajectory? No, I, 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 think, I think we're aligned there. The uh, one thing I was going to mention is that Sometimes I look at I look at the DeFi stuff, um, and I look at essentially like the financial instruments that are being built, um, and I'm and I get concerned. Like, are right. we just rebuilding? We already have that we wanted to get away from for a new yeah. wealth builders, right? Yeah. Are we just are we just rebuilding this stuff? But the, I think the answer is I think the answer is no, um, because when you go when you buy some sort of sophisticated financial instrument from some financial institution, one. You have no idea what you're buying. You buy a gold ETF. Who has the damn gold? Like the, they have an ETF that owes this person, owes this person. That like maybe there's gold in some vault somewhere. You know the, the the amount of misdirection and the amount of opacity in these financial markets and systems um, are set up to like fuck me and to fuck you. Um, and they and the complexities, the unknown complexities that arise from the opacity with which they're all these things are constructed together, um, you know, make things like the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, nobody knows what they're buying. Nobody knows what they're holding. Nobody, like the, the, the actually the intrinsic, like what this thing that I just bought and I'm doing with it, um, no one fucking knows. And, and if they think they know, they know just a slice of the system. Um, and so just in this like, in the DeFi context, obviously there's a tons of things we can do on on Ethereum and on decentralized uh, protocols like this. But in the DeFi context, people are re they're reconstructing certain types of financial instruments and 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 some of these things that you might see in a more traditional context, but in a in a radically new way, in a radically open way, in a radically transparent way, uh, so that these the way that these things like the underlying assets, the way that these things are constructed, the way that the moving parts come together. Um, you and I, we can all look at them. We can all audit them. We can all understand what we're entering into agreements on. And there's no, <clears throat> the access that I have to them is the same as the access to the billionaire sitting in, at his desk at Wall Street. Um, and so it does, it is different. It, this context is new. This context is radical. And Danny, check that out. we're at, we, we have done an hour and 50 minutes of an awesome conversation. Um, thank you so much, man, for doing yeah, that. This that was is blast. awesome. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for engaging. Um, I do, you know, I, I had, I had a ton of, ton of fun hanging out and, and chatting. Um, and as long as somebody keeps serving it to me, I can, I can keep going. So, um, I appreciate it. Fantastic job with the remote conference, uh, you know, rolling with the punches and, uh, serving the community. Um, and good luck with the next couple of days. I'm um, excited to check out some of the content. Thanks, man.